Uh, welcome back to the vastness of Peru. It's um, middle of summer. It's not, it's not warm. Uh, it's not cold though. Um, but it's just vast. Um, I, I tried to go through a little town before and um, nearly got myself in trouble because the road just ended and it just became a sand pit. And uh, yeah, nearly overheated my engine getting the darn thing out of there. Um, so, yeah, got a bit of a crowd around. Yeah, so I'm about um, five hours into the trip now. And um, not far to go. I think it's... Uh, I think I've got about an hour and a half to go. I've had a couple of stops, so I'm going to have a stop pretty shortly. Um, because the second stop I have was basically trying to get my bike back on the road and I was pretty sweaty and crappy, so I didn't really get a chance to rest. I didn't want to hang around there for the embarrassment of uh, probably being the only motorbike that, got, that nearly got stuck at that spot. But it was about a foot deep of sand, soft sand and uh, on a dirt road it, it just all of a sudden just became sand and I nearly lost it. Uh, luckily I held it together and because uh, I was go only going about 25 k an hour and, it, and everything looked like sand because the road was old and there was lots of sand covering it but it was hard and then bang I just hit this all of a sudden the road wasn't there um, yeah. uh, didn't really think about what I was doing I just uh, just try to keep it together and just kept the front wheel moving left to right really fast and she stayed upright, thank God. I was able to slow down enough to get my feet on the ground too, so that helped. Uh, yeah, so, as you can see to my left, the Andes mountain range just continues. It goes further back than that, and it gets bigger and bigger as you go back. You probably can't make it out, but if you're right in the distance, you can see a faint shadow. Uh, and that's where I'm heading tomorrow. I'm going to be staying the night up there somewhere. So it's pretty good. Still a lot of rubbish around. Um, I mean, especially in the small towns, you, you see a beautiful sight, and then you go to take a photo, and you just look down, and you think, shit, this place. Yeah, so it's pretty sad. But it's all over Central and South America. Not hardly any countries were different. Even the more advanced ones still have rubbish everywhere. And you know, you're just driving along and just people throw a can of Coke or a Coke bottle out the window. I mean, I've seen that so often. They just finish it and just toss it. This is, this is their rubbish tip. Yeah. Having a, bit, a little bit more pride in their own country. And, they, and that's one thing. That, that's not the first thing though. The first thing is, Government setting it, setting up systems whereby they pay for a, a, they pay for a ton of rubbish and they pay more for a ton of plastic, more for a ton of metal, more for a ton of aluminium. Yeah. Um, and they said they can be privately run, you know, these companies, and they pay by the weight. The only the only thing the government could lose money on is the garbage. All the plastic and that, that actually make a, a few cents on. And then Coca-Cola and all these other bottling companies and other people can, uh, can buy the, uh, the plastic from them at a rate where the government, uh, it, it becomes a self-sufficient, a, a self-sustaining uh, system, you know. Anyway, that's some interesting topical pieces there. rain water sat there. I don't know where I'm going to bloody stop. It's just open and vast and it's empty. But I'll find somewhere. All I seem to be doing too is overtaking trucks and buses. Anyway, I'll catch back to you when the scenery changes a little bit.
So it's quite interesting listening to yourself as you're uh, as you're listening back to yourself as you're driving along. Um, the, the the talk that I had about the rubbish was that you know it was just it, it, it really became frustrating because you'd see so many beautiful sights and then and you just see rubbish on the road and the people just throw rubbish out. The people you see cars just stopping on the side of the road and just dumping their rubbish because there's no systems in place and so but in they just don't realise, I mean, they're just caught in that, you know? And because of the plastification of everything, like their, their local shops now, when years ago they might have been paper bags, they're all plastic bags, all the bread, all the all the daily consumables are all in plastic. But anyway, I took an off-road route, and you're gonna see it now, um, and went through a town, and and this, I did not, did not know what to expect. Uh, this, I have seen this on videos before from other people, but I was coming along here and um, and I saw this tunnel and I thought, oh, okay, this, this looks interesting. Didn't really recognize it from previous video footage I've watched before of other people. And then it just opened up into something absolutely spectacular. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. And then I had a massive climb down, sweeping around through the turns down. Sort of parts of the trip you always sort of remember is these, I, I, was, I just said fuck, I think. Uh, these sort of things you, you sort of always remember. And uh, I mean, it, it, it looks good here, but it was crazy good from where I was. It looked amazing. Um, and it was, you know, it doesn't look so steep here, but it was very, very steep, left and right side. Some big, massive U-turns. People waving hello. These sort of moments don't sometimes last too long, but... Uh, where you can hear my bike rattling. The road was pretty rough too. This is this. There's a freeway that bypasses this road, um, and that happens a lot. Where you, if you really check out your paper maps, you can really see, you can really see all the different uh, different roads and uh, smart route. As long as the road connects, smart move is always to take these type of roads if you can. Just breaks up your ride and gives you something to video and something to remember. And you, you end up doing this all throughout the trip. You can use the Google Maps. Google Maps has these roads on them, but uh, the paper maps you can plan out beforehand. And then, then as you're taking a break, just go back. There's like, there's like tombstones everywhere on this road. Um, I mean, you're talking, I mean, there might have been 100 tombstones on this road total. You're talking about maybe 50, 100 years of people driving on it. Though. But I mean, if someone dies, they, they erect monuments to, to the people. But um, yeah, and then all of a sudden it just opened up to this, this flourish of green. Again, pretty cool. Now this, this, off, this little trek off-road only probably took me 10 miles off-road. Well, not even that. There you go, I'm, I'm back on the highway again. And they re the reason they do it is one, it's too expensive to dig through those tunnels again. Here's another look at that road. Number two, it's too dangerous. So they, they make these straight roads. Um, and so all these little these little off-road things are usually full of surprises. Not always, but usually full of surprises. So I'm, prob I'm probably a few, a few hours now outside of, uh, a few hours outside of, um, of Nazca now, only a couple of a uh, couple of hours outside, and uh, and um, yeah, I'll always always take those little short roads, especially when they're connecting to the highway. There's usually a reason why they've stopped that road and got you on the main road. Here's a noisy bike on the side of the road, struggling pretty badly. But yeah, so. You go up through a few mountains on this trip, but there's not that many. Um, a lot of it was the desert, probably three, two or three hours on the desert straits. But 
usually the cities are usually in pretty good spots, you know. Curves, belly grades are dangerous, dangerous turns, dangerous curves. Um, more U turns. Usually there's a, I, I usually stop on the, like, I was just seeing the CI, oh, okay, there's a nice spot to stop, but just keep going. So Nazca is quite famous for the Nazca lines, and I and I mentioned it in the, in another in one of the last videos. I'll let, just let it roll out. But the um, the thing is, you've got to basically get an aeroplane to see them because they're on flats. So the only way to get them is a helicopter or aeroplane, and really, it's just lines and the thing. It's pretty cool. There's plenty of stuff already written about and done about that. So I wasn't that interested. But what I did do is I went to a couple of the ruins nearby ruins. Uh, there was one with these aqueducts where they built these circular uh, things for for water, and they and they kept they they would build them and then they dig them deeper and they go around in this little this little spiral until you got down to the bottom of them, um, and that, they were all really cool, you know. And they were used used for basically for their farming and, and for those purposes, um, so that they had water for the farm farming all the time. And so once one of them dried out, they just built another one. And they were smart enough to know where they were. And there was bigger structures beforehand. They had these massive structures. I actually, I actually, this is a, I can remember this now. I, this is one of the first times I. Had a little bit of issue with the old stomach. End up spending about ten or fifteen minutes in this gas station, uh, exhausting the problem. There's a, uh, a bathroom up the other side, and the floor was just full of water and piss. It was pretty, pretty bad. But you know, this is a good trip today. You know, seven eight hours of riding is 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 not too bad when you consider you're really doing about five hours of actual riding, and the rest is just having a look around, taking a break, and um, just enjoying it. You know, um, it's not as much fun when you're just doing straightaways. But uh, every little town has something interesting. The way people live and survive, and you know, for me, always the happiness of kids. Just always seeing uh, really happy kids and stuff like that. And they're out playing, you know. They're outside playing. They're not sitting. I mean, you do see it in the cities on them with the mobile phones, but they're out playing and just enjoying themselves, you know. Usually, soccer is the is the sport that you see them out there. You see some some volleyball and stuff like that. Some of the towns have traffic lights in them, and you just don't know why, like. It's not as if the roads are just full of traffic. There's some police on the left-hand side. They're, usually the police and the military are more concerned about the trucks and the transport. But yeah, I, I, um, I, I began to really get into the little, little off-roads, especially when I only had an eight hour day of, of you know five hours of riding three hours of breaks so i'd always try to explore different little roads here and there and i did a little bit of off-roading on this trip as well not not a huge amount maybe only 40 or 50 kilometers um which is a you know it's it's you know 30 miles of off-roading is is yeah you know, it's not extreme stuff or anything like that but as i um mentioned in, a, in one of the videos I, I went through one of the towns and it was just it was all really hard dirt roads there's a bit of wind in through that town as well as it, it was up up on the top of the mountain and um, and then all of a sudden it just went from dirt to just deep sand with no warning you know except for the fact that you could it, it looked, just looked funny it looked a little bit different than the other road and then a foot of sand for, for quite a while and <laughs> you know, with a heavy bike filled with stuff you really don't want to be hitting sand when you don't know it's sand. You you want to you want to be able to plan it out and 
you know, maybe even get off your bike and walk it a little bit and just see where it's harder. If it's harder on the shoulder rather than through the guts, through the guts is usually the worst part because that's where it's all been churned up. Uh, or if you've got an extra strategy, because you don't want to be riding through sand. I don't care what what situation you're in. If you can avoid sand, you want to avoid sand. Um, you know, I mean, I got through pretty much everything. The toughest day I had was hours of, of unpacking my bike, walking it 100, 200 metres at a time, walking all the gear back and forth. Like you can, it took me three trips each time with my gear. And then I'd take my bike and I'd ride it as much as I can. And then I'd walk uh, on beside it and just, just keeping the revs up, you know, it's just hard work, you know, because you, it's just, yeah. Yeah, two or three hours, you know, two hours of it to go maybe one kilometre, you know. It's not fun. It's not fun at all. This is one of the, that was one of the off-road uh, roads I went on and I just sat down and had a drink and it was uh, just having a bit of a break. It's a whole lot of nothingness. And it wasn't a lot of off-road there. I think there was only a short pass that one just to get between two lines. So what I do with that is I have my GoPro, and the GoPro right now is taking a photo every 10, 5, 10, 15 seconds, whatever it is. And I just, just put the, uh, the stand up, put the GoPro up, and, um, and, then, uh, and then just turn it on. I just forget about it until, oh, there it is. Okay, better grab that. Uh, so as you can see with my bike, I've got two bags on each of the side cases, one bag on each. I've got my tent on the backpack and you can see the red container on the other side, there's a white container. The red container's got a gallon of fuel and the extra gallon of fuel and the white container's got a, um, a gallon of water. There we go. So I'm here at the Nazca Lines, I, I just passed it, I mean you can't really even see it from the, from the ground, um, I might go back um, towards sunset and try to get the drone up, uh, we'll just see how many people are there and whether or not I'm allowed, Peru has some reason, reasonably strict rules um, uh, regarding drones. Um, and uh, it's best not to fly it anywhere near any anywhere where there's people. So I'm either going to go I'm, this afternoon, but more than likely I'm going to I'm going to plan my route tomorrow, and then see if I can get here by first light. So that'll be pretty spectacular if I can get um, the drone up. No one around at uh, 6 a.m. in the morning, um, but we'll wait and see. You can see the uh, there. I'm going to have to really plot it pretty well because I mean I can't see anything. <laughs> um, but I do know that this part of uh, Peru, I don't I don't know when they last recorded rainfall, uh, and that's why this this uh, geographical um, artwork has survived for so long because there's no weather here really. Um, no, no, no extreme winds, um, no, um, no, no rainfall. Um, I, I actually have to look it up, but I'm pretty sure it hasn't rained here for for years and years, decades. Or the amount has been so minimal that it can barely be recorded. Um, and as you can see, hardly anything grows. Uh, back back a bit further, the government. Had, uh, along a little bit of the new section of the highway and this feels reasonably new uh, but they planted about a thousand trees on each side and they're all dying um, so I don't know uh, who planted them and what, what, what information they gave them about how hardy they were but they're all they're pretty much all dead um, it's a bit sad but I mean you, you, if you're going to plant trees in a place like this you've got to obviously contain the, uh, the, the, the water 
uh, within within the root system of the plant. So I don't. Otherwise, you just watering them. Every, you'd have to water them every other day, you know. So anyway, it's an interesting landscape. It's it's empty but quite beautiful, if you know what I mean. Uh, it's just such an extreme from you know Ecuador um, into Peru. The the extremes are so dramatic. I mean, Peru's still got the rainforests and the and the uh, sort of um, Ecuadorian, a quite Equatorian uh, sort of um, a weather system. But as you come further south, that you get into the desert, you know, quite quite quickly. You know, within within two or three hours of hitting Peru. But it is spectacular. I'm about uh, 10, 15 kilometres from Nazca, uh, where I'm going to bunk up for the night. Um, and I can think I can see the city there now as we come up over the hill. I've actually got to go and look for my hotel now because I know it's, a, it's near the airport. But spotting an airport from here is near impossible com considering there's probably only about one or two flights a day. All right, guys. Cheerio. Have a good day. Any questions or comments, leave them below and I'll answer them as soon as I get a chance. Thanks guys. So this, this here is the aqueduct system. Um, as you can see, it's uh, each one, there's like lot, there's a whole bunch of them. And each one just circles all the way down until they, you can drop a water bucket in, someone climbs down and you get the water and then you lift, lift it out. And there, there was one line of them there and there was another line elsewhere. And there used to be a huge long, that's a wide angle of a couple of them. Yeah. And that's the setting in Nazca. Pretty cool spot. Good for a one night hideaway. Alright guys, questions and comments below as usual. Have a good day.